Hi all, welcome back to the MNSC Medicine Lecture Series. In the current video, I am going to discuss about one of the most important topics, non-invasive oxygenation monitoring via pulse oximetry. You would have known that pulse oximetry is one of the most commonly used instrument as part of vital sign recording, as part of as an adjunct to the primary survey. SpO2 is recorded via the pulse oximetry and you all know that it can be a portable instrument, most often a finger mounted instrument which can be used by anyone without any knowledge or with minimal knowledge. This can be used either in the pre-hospital setup or in resource limited regions or in advanced setups for continuous monitoring of the oxygenation. I am Dr. S. Prakash Babu, Associate Professor of Department of Emergency Medicine, Kims and R.C. Changalpattu. Coming to the learning objectives of today's video lecture. By the end of this lecture, you need to understand the principles of pulse oximetry and the components that make up the pulse oximeter. As you know, pulse oximetry is the investigation or the vital sign that you take while the pulse oximeter is an instrument that is used to record this vital sign. You will understand the physiology of oxygen saturation. You will be able to decipher the uses and limitations of pulse oximetry. You will be able to interpret pulse oximetry readings in any given clinical situation and correlate to the patient, individualize to the patient and you will be able to appreciate the limitations of non-invasive oxygen monitoring and the need for more precise investigations. Pulse measures, pulse oximetry measures the percentage of hemoglobin binding of oxygen non-invasively. So there is a non-invasive and easy to obtain the values. Anyone can do it without any medical knowledge also. Also it provides real-time estimates of arterial oxygen saturation which will aid in monitoring the patient throughout the clinical course. It gives early warnings of diminished capillary perfusion. Not only that it shows the oxygenation level, you can also find out whether the tissue perfusion is adequate or not. Most importantly, it avoids the risk associated with the repeated arterial puncture to analyze the blood gases. It is a standard of monitoring in clinical practice and it is evolved into the first and foremost step in assessing a patient's respiration, especially the oxygenation. We need to learn something about the technology that is used in recording the pulse oximetry. Oximetry is based on Beer Lambert's law. Beer Lambert's law states that concentration of any unknown solute which is dissolved in a solvent can be determined by the characteristics of its light absorption and it is given by the equation for any particular wavelength a absorbance is equal to e the molar absorptivity which is a constant for any particular substance and is given by liter per mole centimeters into b which is the path length in centimeters that is the distance that the light has to traverse before it reaches the target and the concentration of the substance that you are measuring which is given as moles per liter. So the pulse oximetry combines the principles of optimal plethysmography and spectrophotometry. So this is a basic design pulse oximetry. I am describing here the finger mount pulse oximeter. There are other types of pulse oximeter which can be mounted on the ear lobule, nose, nasal septum to monitor the central oxygenation. Most commonly is the pulse finger mounted pulse oximeter which contains two ends. On the one side of the pulse oximeter you see here there is a light emitting diode 
which emits a light of two different wavelengths in case of pulse oximetry the light traverses through the tissues of the nail bed that is the nail the pulp of the nail and the skin and then there is a photo detector on the other side when the light is passing from the light emitting diode through the tissues some of the light is absorbed and some of the light is transmitted through the photo detector the photo detector will calculate the percentage of light that is transmitted through the other side without absorption and this light emitting diode and the photo detector are mounted into the probe body which is made of mostly plastic material so in case of the normal pulse oximeter red and infrared light infrared light are emitted at two different wavelengths which we will know shortly and computer algorithms will calculate by fixed formulas and then they derive the oxygen saturation in the blood the probe is made up of two photodiodes set into a reusable clip or a disposable patch they emit red light at 660 nanometers and infrared light at 900 to 940 nanometers a photo detector is placed across the vascular bed pulse oximeter sensors are typically placed on the fingers with the light centered over the nail bed but not on the pad fed of the nail for accurate readings toes and ear lobes can also be used in pediatric population and as i told earlier the nasal septum can be used for central oxygenation monitoring absorption characteristics of hemoglobin when it is oxygenated and when it is deoxygenated are in reduced form at these wavelengths are different that is the basic principle of deciphering the oxygen saturation in the blood the major part of the light is absorbed by the skin connective tissue bone and the venous blood because there is fixed amount of tissue which absorbs light in these parts that is the skin connective tissue bone and the venous blood the amount of light absorbed by these tissues is a constant and it will not change when you come to the arterial end with each heartbeat there is increase in the blood in the arterial side of the capillaries which is called the pulse style flow the amount of light absorbed by the arterial blood where also varies with the pulse this is the variation which is detected with the pulse oximeters oxygen saturation is derived by comparing the difference between the pulse style light absorption and the constant light absorption at the given two wavelengths normal pulse oximeter uses only two wavelengths and can distinguish only from oxyhemoglobin to reduced hemoglobin it measures the functional saturation that is the ratio of concentration of oxyhemoglobin to the concentration of oxyhemoglobin plus reduced hemoglobin that is the saturation that is produced the only disadvantage is that the denominator does not include other hemoglobin species like the methemoglobin or carboxymethemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin then what is the advantage of using only two wavelengths the advantage is that using only two wavelengths in the oximeter is that the cost size and weight of the device are reduced when you use a photodiode there are other instruments like cooximeter where you use more wavelengths to differentiate between different species of hemoglobin that is the principle used for measuring met hemoglobinemia and carboxy hemoglobinemia when those conditions are suspected come into the physiology basis of how the pulse oximeter works arterial o2 saturation otherwise called as sao2 measures the large reservoir of o2 carried by hemoglobin whereas the arterial oxygen partial pressure that is pao2 which is analyzed by the arterial blood gas measures only the relatively small amount of oxygen 
that is dissolved in the plasma. Usually the SaO2 correlates well with PaO2, but the relationship is non-linear and is described by the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. In hypoxemic patients, small changes in SaO2 represent large changes in PaO2. Measurement of SaO2 are relatively insensitive in detecting significant changes in PaO2 at high levels of oxygen. The currently available pulse oximeters are very accurate and precise in giving the saturation when the arterial oxygen saturation is in the range of 70 to 100%. So, this is the depiction to show how the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve works. And the y axis, you take oxygen saturation in percentage, and on the x axis, you take PaO2 in millimeters of mercury. So, when you plot a curve against SaO2 and PaO2, they correlate well, but as I told earlier, it's not a linear relationship, rather, it's a sigmoid curve. So, measurement of SaO2 are relatively insensitive in detecting significant changes in PaO2 at high levels of oxygen. When the oxygen levels are very high, it is falling on the flatty phase of the curve, hence, there will not be major changes in PaO2, whereas at low levels of oxygen, especially in hypoxemic patients, it is falling on the steep part of the curve. Even a small change in O2 saturation will give a major difference in PaO2 levels. This is the basis of your pulse oximeter principle. So, what are the clinical applications of pulse oximetry? It is commonly used for assessing adequacy of reoxygenation before endotracheal intubation, monitoring oxygenation during an emergency airway management, monitoring the ventilator and changes in FiO2, providing an early indicator of ventilatory dysfunction, assisting in routine weaning from O2 therapy, monitoring patients in acute respiratory distress, and monitoring during procedural sedation and analgesia. Monitoring during pre-hospital and the intra-hospital transport can also be done with a pulse oximetry. What are the indications for <coughs> obtaining the pulse oximetry readings? As a real-time indicator of hypoxemia, pulse oximetry has proven continuous oximetry reading can be used as a warning system for early deterioration in a patient. As an endpoint for titration of therapeutic interventions, to avoid hypoxia, it can also be used to assess the peripheral perfusion and evaluate for possible ischemia in the extremities. Decreased peripheral oxygenation may be detected in patients with compartment syndrome, traumatic arterial injury, and external compression of proximal circulation. These are the clinical indications where you can use pulse oximetry. Coming to the procedure, how you obtain the pulse oximetry readings. Location of the probe is determined by the clinical situation and the type of probe that is available to you at a given situation. A reusable clip, which is very commonly used, works well on digits that are easily accessible and is the most commonly used procedure. Other sites include earlobe, the nasal bridge, septum, forehead, and temporal artery, and the putter form up in pinch. When you use these sites, you need specialized devices more central locations give more accurate results and they depict the central circulation tapes and splints can be used to secure oximetry probes in place so when you have connected the pulse oximeter as i told earlier there is light emission some of the light is absorbed and some of the light is transmitted. The transmitted light is collected and then the computer analyzes the incoming data to identify the arterial pulsation and displays this parameter as beats per minute. With each heartbeat, there will be a wave produced that is called the pulse wave or the platysmographic wave. Some older pulse oximeters will give only the numeral value of SpO2 whereas the newer devices will give the pulse plethysmograph you all know what is a pulse plethysmograph when you have connected the monitor 
this is beats per second and there's a percentage of spo2 there is a pulse wave form auto saturation is displayed on a beat to beat basis so how are you going to interpret the pulse oximetry readings that you have obtained patients with normal physiologic gas exchange have an auto saturation between 97 to 100% oxygen saturation below 90% represents hypoxemia low saturation of o2 readings should be heeded as important clinical warning signs they are 100% sensitive and 54% specific for detecting hypoxemia which is a pao2 of less than 70 millimeters of mercury and they are 100% sensitive and only 30% specific for detecting hypercapnia that is pseo2 level of greater than 50 millimeters of mercury pulse oximetry is not a substitute for monitoring ventilation because of variable lag time between the onset of hypoventilation or the apnea and the change in auto saturation so pulse oximetry should be used as a surrogate marker invariably you need to obtain the arterial blood gases for accurate readings of pao2 and there are certain factors that affect the pulse oximetry readings in severe anemia satisfactory readings up and down to a hemoglobin level of 5 mg person but if the patient is having a hemoglobin level less than 5 mg person the values that are given by the pulse oximeter are not reliable motion of artifact you all all would have experienced this motion artifact problem if the patient is altered sensorium and constantly moving the wave will not be produced properly because the probe will be moving to different sites and light absorption varies which the computer algorithms may not detect or even if they detect they will not be able to decipher dice especially like methemoglobinemia intraarterial dice transient effects unless resulting in methemoglobinemia or the dice which are applied over the nails nail polish will affect the readings light artifact when other light is passing through the pulse oximeter that can be absorbed and the photo detector might detect more light that is traversing that will affect it is usually minimized by covering the probe with an op opaque material hypoperfusion there is an inadequate pulse signal which will be displayed it depends on the machine which is being used during hypoperfusion some of the machines will fail to detect any signal and thus they will not display any readings in other machines there will be a weak reading with a signal that inadequate pulse electrocautery the site of electrocautery there will be increased temperature which can be detected as light and it interferes with your pulse oximetry readings it can be minimized by increasing the distance of the sensor from the surgical site the patient is having deep pigmentation use the fifth finger ear lobe or other area with a lighter pigmentation as i told earlier dark nail polish will interfere you need to remove the nail polish with a nail polish remover or place sensor sideways on the digit so that it traverses the pulp dyshemoglobinemia especially the carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobinemia there can be falsely elevated true oxygen saturation readings elevated bilirubin accurate up to a bilirubin level of 20 mg per cent in adults high oxygen tensions pulse oximetry is not useful for monitoring as i told earlier hyperoxemia in neonates interferes with pulse oximetry readings fetal hemoglobin has no effect on pulse oximetry as such but falsely reduced cooximetry readings can be seen venous pulsations artificially lower the o2 saturation you should choose a probe site above the heart dialysis grafts with an arteriovenous fistula no difference from the contralateral extremity unless the fistula is producing a distal ischemia so to conclude pulse oximetry is widely available technology that provides an easy 
non-invasive, cost-effective, and generally reliable method of monitoring oxygenation. Because the measurements are continuous, pulse oximetry allows earlier detection of hypoxemic episodes, then intermittent arterial blood gas analysis that you do at specific intervals. Frequent measurements can lead to earlier corrective measures and prevention of adverse consequences. Not only that, there are some future directions that are being developed. New devices focusing on regional oxygen saturation like the cerebral oximetry are being developed. This technology uses near infrared spectroscopy to obtain tissue level O2 saturations. Cerebral oximetry can be used to assess quality of CPR. Can be used to monitor patients with altered mental status, including pharmacologically induced sedation. So this concludes the lecture. Thank you. Don't forget to share and subscribe for wider reach of the lectures. Thank you so much.